get started because for the next three to four hours we got a lot of information. So I, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> they tricked you when you said only an hour. Right? <laughs> All right, so we're going to talk about dementia, which isn't necessarily the greatest topic to talk about as far as it brings a lot of different emotions with dementia. So I'm going to be talking to you about dementia. Most people that deal with dementia, 70% roughly, of all people that have dementia are dealing with Alzheimer's disease. Okay, so most of my talk tonight is going to be addressing Alzheimer's disease. And I want to start with this gentleman right here. This is actually my wife, Natalie. I think a lot of you know who Natalie is. This is her grandpa. And I remember meeting her grandpa, very active, very um, vibrant man, um, even in his 80s. He was walking everywhere. He would, they lived in Bismarck, North Dakota, and he would walk to the bank. He'd walk to the grocery store, buy their groceries, do their banking. He would walk to church. And so very, very active guy. And um, when we lived in Bismarck, I got to live with them for a while. I got to see how active he was out in his garden all the time. But we moved to uh, the Twin Cities here. We moved here for me to go to chiropractic school. And a few years after we had moved out of Bismarck, um, they said that he's dealing with Alzheimer's. And I'm like, no way. I mean, I, I was just, you know, lived with him. I, I didn't see any signs of it. I couldn't believe it. Here's this healthy, vibrant man. How could he be dealing with Alzheimer's disease? And so, when we hadn't seen him probably in about six months or so, and we saw him, it was very evident. He'd keep asking you the same question over and over again. And so, it was, it was hard to see this. And so, I think he was diagnosed when he was about 82 years old. Now, Butch here lived to be 95 years old, okay? Not quite 95. It was almost his birthday when he passed away. So, for 13 years, he lived with this illness, okay? And so it, it was sad to see, again, he couldn't go for walks. He was physically healthy enough that he could go for walks, but he couldn't go for walks because they were worried that he couldn't find his way home, he'd get lost. And so it was really hard to see him deal with this, uh, go through this. Now, one of the nice things, though, as you've seen, probably I'm guessing all of you are dealing with someone that's either dealing with Alzheimer's, maybe you're worried about it yourself. And so um, one of the things about him, though, that was nice is that it didn't seem to really bother him, that he couldn't remember. So you'd come and say, you'd see him at the nursing home, and you'd say, hey, Butch, great to see you. Do you know who I am? It's like, no, I have no idea who you are, but it didn't bother him. It didn't seem to, to make him mad, which you'll see some people with Alzheimer's. It'd be really frustrating because how many have ever gone into a room and couldn't remember, well, why did I come into this room? Okay, we've all, yeah. <laughs> so we, we've all dealt with that, right? Or how many have lost their, you know, set down their keys and didn't really think about where you set your keys down or put your wallet down. Or, so we've all had that. <clears throat> Or maybe you see someone like, oh, I know their name. I remember, I just can't remember their name. I, I, I should know their name. And it, it can be really frustrating. So can you imagine that would be your life all the time, trying to remember, okay, I know I should know these people, but I don't. And so it's very frustrating to see that. Again, with Butch, it didn't bother him one bit. <laughs> and so you can see that it impacts people in a much different ways. But what it does is it doesn't ever just impact the person dealing with the disease, right? Um, if you're a caregiver, or if you have a spouse or a loved one dealing with it, or again, you're dealing with it yourself, or you're worried about it, it is gonna impact the entire family. It's gonna impact everybody involved in it. And so it's a, it's a disease that can impact a person's life, like we saw with Butch, that's seemingly a healthy person, and it's a disease that can impact the entire family because of it, okay? So we've all probably heard of somebody dealing with cancer, right? We've all probably know someone that's had heart disease, okay? Can you guys, um, if I um, ask you if you've ever heard of someone actually being healed of those diseases, have you guys heard of someone being cured of cancer? Yes. Have you ever heard of someone being cured of heart disease? Yeah. Have you ever heard of anyone being cured of dementia? And so when you get that diagnosis, it's also a really hard diagnosis to get because you don't know of anybody that's ever been healed of this disease, okay? And yet tonight I'm going to show you that there are things that can be done. 
It can be prevented, it can be slowed down, and it can absolutely be reversed. And there's research that's showing that these things are all possible, okay? So there is hope in this, okay? There isn't, um, uh, when you go to the doctor, there isn't a lot of hope. When you hear that diagnosis, they tell you, really, it's a progressive disease. There's not much you're going to be able to do about it. And these are the stages that this person is going to go through. And it's almost, it's, it's inevitable that this is what's going to happen to this person. And so what I want to do tonight is a few things. I want to, one, I want to help people to understand, well, what is actually happening in someone's brain? Why is it that they're developing dementia? Is it just something that's genetic and it's, gonna, it's inevitable for a person? Is it something that there's nothing that can be done about it. Uh, we're going to talk about those things and then we're going to talk about um, different um, expressions of dementia, different types of dementia and then we're going to talk also about um, is there anything that can be done um, to help that person like I'd mentioned to prevent it, slow it down or even reverse it and there absolutely is. I'm not going to go into great detail tonight about what those things are because there's lots of things and if I did this would be a four or five hour seminar and we don't have that time tonight. But we do have time to talk about uh, what is going on with the brain. So um, these are the different types of dementia, okay? Um, I'm just by show of hands, uh, looking at some of the, uh, the dementia types that you guys might be dealing with personally or have a loved one. Um, just let me know, is anyone here dealing with or has a loved one dealing with vascular dementia? Okay, so yeah, so vascular. So vascular would usually be a stroke has caused damage to the brain and that part of the brain is damaged, okay? That part of the brain, those cells are gone, okay? And typically it's gonna be the temporal lobe that's being impacted, that's why it's impacting their memory because the hippocampus is where that happens, okay? Um, how about Lewy body dementia? So, you, uh, so a level one dealing with Lewy body. If you don't know what Lewy body is, it's a combination of Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. So you literally have Parkinson's and you have Alzheimer's disease and it's a pretty serious one because you're dealing with the Alzheimer's but you're also dealing with the, um, the uh, movement disorder that comes with Parkinson's so it's a really tough uh, 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 type of dementia. How about Alzheimer's? So a few of you and so with Alzheimer's a lot of times they'll say well we don't know if you actually have Alzheimer's until we do a biopsy and that's usually at death. So an autopsy is when you would uh, um, find out if a person truly has Alzheimer's. There is more studies coming out that you can actually do uh, measure. Um, are you guys familiar with the term amyloid plaques? Okay, so and we'll get into some more detail about that in a minute. But Alzheimer's disease um, can be diagnosed by looking at someone's cerebral spinal fluid and it can tell you if there's um, elevated uh, markers that could tell you if they do have Alzheimer's. Trauma-induced, trauma-induced could be like lots of head traumas. We're seeing that, do you guys uh, know what sport uh, we're seeing that in? Yeah, the NFL is a, is a big one that you see. So you call it the um, uh, chronic traumatic encephalitis. So basically their brain is constantly inflamed and it's impacted their their memory. Anybody dealing with a loved one that's dealing with that? All right, and then there's mixed. What I mean by that is you could have a vascular, you could have Alzheimer's, you could have um, a trauma, all of the above causing you to have dementia. Frontal temporal lobe. So with Alzheimer's disease, it starts in the temporal lobe. The temporal lobes are where our hippocampus or our memories are formed here, and then it goes to the frontal lobe. And so you'll start to see memory issues first, but then you'll start to see behavior issues in those people. Okay, you'll start to see their personalities uh, potentially changing. They're not the same person. Maybe they become angry. Um, so that's what happens with Alzheimer's, but with frontal temporal, it starts with the frontal lobe and it works its way back to the temporal lobe. So the frontal lobe, again, is where we make executive decisions. It's where we, um, our behavior, our personality resides in our frontal lobe. And so you'll see that first, and then you'll see memory start to go in frontal temporal lobe. Um, and then Creutzfeldt-Jacob, that's an actual illness. Creutzfeldt-Jacob, mad cow disease or chronic wasting disease. And so that prion gets into the brain and then it impacts um, how well their memory can work because um, it's impacting the temporal lobe. Hydrocephalus, that's just where you can't get water off the brain and so that pressure starts to cause damage to the uh, temporal lobe. And then Wernicke-Korsakoff, that's typically due to alcohol destroying the brain. 
Okay, so those are the different types. Like I said, most of tonight's talk is going to be on Alzheimer's disease, just because it's we've had the most research on Alzheimer's disease, and the other thing that we look at is the most um, uh, people are uh, with dementia are dealing with Alzheimer's disease. Okay, any questions with this at all? All right, so like I had mentioned, really we don't know a lot of people that have that. So in our office. Um, we have a vision, and our vision is to really provide hope to those people that have lost hope. Okay, a lot of times we go to the doctor, and doctors are pretty good at stripping all your hope away. They just—they're very um, scientific-minded. They're very um, analytical, very black and white. That okay, there's just no hope. Um, you have Alzheimer's disease. This is how it's going to progress. This is what the research shows. So this is what you can expect. Okay, and we just disagree with that approach to um, health. We. Um, how many are familiar with the placebo effect? Okay, so the placebo effect almost always works in a study. Okay, so why, why does it always work? Because when you give people belief about something, when you give them hope about something, they can overcome some amazing things. So rather than not use the placebo effect, we really believe that the placebo effect should be utilized, but not in a way that's manipulative, but in a way that give those people hope. Okay, show them that there is things that can be done, and that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Because there is hope. We're not about going around uh, and spreading a bunch of false hope. We're about teaching people that there is people that are working with Alzheimer's. There are practitioners that are working with Alzheimer's. We've seen it in our office. There are people that um, have studies that are showing that can the Alzheimer's disease, dementia can be slowed down, reversed. Um, prevented. So that's what we're going to talk about tonight. And so hopefully you can see that there is actually hope even with that, um, with that uh, diagnosis. How many have ever heard of the gene APOE4? So you've heard of the APOE gene, uh, you've heard of it. So this is a gene, because we're going to talk about some of the risk factors on why someone would be at risk for dementia. And so the APOE4 gene is a gene that if you have this gene, you are 80 to 85% more likely to develop Alzheimer's disease. Okay? So it's a significant gene, and yet most of you have never even heard of this gene. Okay, and so if a person has this gene, it does not mean that they're just going to get Alzheimer's disease. It doesn't mean that, hey, I've got this APOE4 gene, I'm going to get Alzheimer's disease. Just like, are you guys familiar with the bronchi gene when it comes to breast cancer? So if a person has that gene, that bronchi gene, they are going to be at more risk for breast cancer, but it doesn't mean they're going to get breast cancer. Okay, so there's things that if a person finds out they have APOE, Four, there's things that they can do, and we're going to talk about that. Okay, and this is mostly related to Alzheimer's. How do you find out if you have that? Yeah, so um, good question. So there is a lot of different tests that you can do, like genetic companies out there. Um, it used to be that you could go to 23andMe or do Ancestry, and they would actually tell you. They stopped releasing that information. So they have the information, but they won't release it to you. And I think the reason why is just logistics as far as legalities and such. So they won't release it to you. So it used to be you could look at that, but there's like um, uh, Prometheus is another genetic company that will do those tests and they will tell you if you have that APOE4. So what you do is you get a kit, so these companies, they'll send you a kit in the mail, and then you take a swab of your cheek or you spit in the tube, and then you send it back to them, and then they'll um, give you a report and they'll tell you your risk factors for certain illnesses based off of these genetics that we have. So the APOE4 can be done through Prometheus. Uh, genetic uh, Nutrition Genome is another one. These are all ones that anybody can order themselves. Okay? Um, you can go to your doctor, though, and your doctor can order these genetic tests as well. Um, you can get a full genetic map nowadays. It used to be like that would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. Then it went down to like tens of thousands of dollars. Now for under $1,000, you can get your full genetic mapping done. Now for some people, they don't really want to know this information because um, they're worried about, you know, is that going to just stress me out all the time? Or they're also worried about what if the insurance company finds that out 
and then they get that information and now they deny me insurance because they see that I've got this gene. So some people, what they'll do, they'll do it anonymously. They'll give it like a John Doe type of name, Jane Doe, and um, get that kit and then it's not tied to your name whatsoever. So, um, so that's one way that you can do it is um, through that um, um, uh, personal kits or the other way is to go to the doctor and ask for it. If you go through the doctor, for sure, they will have that information in your medical records. So um, the, the insurance company is really not supposed to be able to access your insurance or your medical records, but um, who knows? Uh, 23andMe got in a lot of trouble because they were releasing personal information to people. So there is some risk to that. That's why if you just use an anonymous name, then you can get a um, by with it. So, so these are some of the other risk factors. Inflammation. What other illnesses have you guys heard that can cause, that inflammation would cause? Diabetes. Yep. What else? Uh, arthritis. Absolutely. What else? How about heart disease? Heart disease, the number one cause of heart disease is inflammation. Cancers. They're related to inflammation. So if you look at that as a risk factor, you will see that if you can take care of that, you will cross the board with many illnesses, be able to help yourself by um, reducing that inflammation. You're going to also reduce your risk of heart disease, cancers, arthritis. So it's really important to look at inflammation. How would you know if you have inflammation in your body? Well, if it's joints, right, you'd probably have some achy joints, okay, and you definitely see that. If it's the heart, though, you're not going to have a lot of pain because the heart doesn't have a lot of pain receptors, and most people don't know they have heart disease until they have a heart attack. But the number one way to look at it is to actually look to see if what we call homocysteine levels are high and if your cholesterol is high. Okay, those are going to be both markers that show whether you have um, inflammation. Has anyone ever heard of homocysteine before? No, and so you have. Yep. So one of you. So again, this is the probably one of the. It, it's definitely a better predictor than cholesterol is when you look at um, inflammatory markers. And yet, most of you don't even know that that's a um, uh, a marker that you should go get um, tested. So when you go to your doctor and have your routine physical, you should demand for them to do homocysteine levels too, because and homo is just spelled H-O-M-O, and then cysteine C-Y-S-T-E. I N E. So homocysteine. It's, it's literally just an amino acid, but that amino acid creates all kinds of problems. Um, it, uh, it actually literally works like little ninja knives in your blood vessels, causing damage to it. Okay? And so another thing that we'll see as a risk factor is having deficiencies. Deficiencies in nutrients and then deficiencies in hormones. Okay? These are two big ones that if we have those issues, we're going to have. Um, uh, increased risk for certain illnesses, including dementia. Uh, toxicity, too much of something, that can cause um, um, Alzheimer's, other types of dementia. So what are some of the things that you guys remember that they've said that can cause Alzheimer's, can lead to Alzheimer's? What have you guys been told? Yeah, so traumas, yep. So that, it's kind of a toxin, but it's, uh, I'm thinking more of a chemical toxin. So anything you guys can think of? What's that? Alcohol? Yeah, definitely alcohol is a toxin that can uh, impact our brains. But how about aluminum pots and pans? Do you guys remember that in the 80s they said, oh, aluminum pots and pans, that's what's causing Alzheimer's. So they told us all to get rid of our aluminum pans, and what did we buy instead? Teflon, yeah, is Teflon a really good, um, probably not. Stainless steel is a better choice, okay? And then what did they do to cans? Because pop cans had it, uh, aluminum, uh, your soup cans had aluminum. So what did they do to them, or did they do anything to them? They've lined them. What did they line them with? Plastic. And what did they, and, and so, yeah, so just another toxin, right? BPA, right? So it's like, okay, how do we get around this stuff? And so what we try to tell people is try to minimize your exposure to things out of cans and, and make sure you're cooking with uh, stainless steel. So toxins can really 
create our, um, an increased risk for um, dementia and Alzheimer's. And then we had mentioned traumas, uh, traumas can, and then vascular, okay? So really what we want to talk about um, as we go through this is just like, so what are the, um, what is really going on with the brain? So like if I have these exposures to toxins or if I have these exposures to um, a trauma or if I have not enough of something or too much of something, what is going on with the brain then that that would cause the person to develop dementia? So I asked uh, earlier how many had ever heard of an amyloid plaque before, okay? So an amyloid plaque is what's been implicated. They say that this is what causes people to have Alzheimer's disease, okay? And an amyloid plaque is really, we have these uh, proteins on our nerves and we have to get rid of them. So um, when we are um, aging or cells are aging in our bodies, they become old. We have to get rid of them, okay? We use our immune system to go around looking for cells that are starting to fail, and then they destroy those cells. The other thing that our body has is a protective mechanism called apoptosis, which is literally just cell suicide. Your, your cell recognizes that it's not working the way it's supposed to, and it literally kills itself, okay? And so we have these um, amyloid proteins on the outside of neurons, and our body is constantly to looking to see, okay, do I need to get rid of these amyloid proteins? Have they become old and they're not working the way they're supposed to? And so your immune system will get rid of those, okay? The problem is in people that are having um, issues with uh, memory and such is that they could be not clearing out those amyloid proteins. So they take the, their immune system starts cleaving them, but it doesn't get rid of them, okay? And the problem with that is that it starts to interfere with neuron function and the neurons won't work the way they're supposed to, okay? And I'm going to come back to this because a lot of times, again, people look at, then this is the cause of it. If these proteins are not getting cleared out, then the problem is we get this protein buildup, okay? And the solution then is that you would just get rid of these amyloid plaques, right? So if that's what's causing the problem, if you just got rid of these amyloid plaques, you could solve Alzheimer's disease, okay? Are you guys familiar with um, any medications that get rid of amyloid plaques? So Ativir and then, yep, and then so Nemended, they are um, two drugs that you give to people with dementia. They do not work on getting rid of amyloid plaques. And so what's interesting, and that's what most people think, is, oh, it's getting rid of these things. Um, the research that they've done with drugs that get rid of amyloid plaques is usually the patients see very little benefit or they actually get worse, okay? Aricept. And so that, yeah, Aricept, yep, and Amanda. And so what happens is um, these people, they were, they were getting rid of these plaques. Again, if you think that that's the cause, then all you have to do is get rid of it. These people should be better, but they actually either didn't see much improvement at all or they got worse. And I'm going to tell you why that is in just a minute, because what we're seeing is, is amyloid plaques really the cause of Alzheimer's disease, or is it maybe something else? And you know, like I said, we'll get to that. Uh, neurofibril tangles, this is another thing that they've been implicated with causing Alzheimer's disease. And what those neurofibril tangles are, is our neurons, again, they're made up of this structure and as that structure, when we start tearing down those old cells, we're supposed to get rid of these. And what can happen is we don't get rid of it and we start to develop. Uh, have you guys ever heard of tau proteins? Is that maybe some of you? And so again, these are words that a lot of times are thrown around in the Alzheimer's community. And so again, these tau proteins, they start to develop these neurofibril tangles because again, the body's not clearing out those proteins as it gets rid of those cells. And so the problem with that is, again, is it can interfere with those neurons function the way that it's supposed to. Um, this here is uh, another protein, alpha-synucleon. This you'll see in other types of dementia or even just in other parts of the brain that aren't working properly. So you'll see it in frontal temporal lobe um, dementia, but you'll also see it in other um, brain issues because again, it's a protein that's not being got, like your body's not getting rid of it, not clearing it like it's supposed to. So alpha-synuclein can be another one of these um, um, issues here. Um, I thought I had one on. 
Louis bodies. So I'll just explain Louis bodies. So Louis bodies is again uh, proteins in our brain that our body's just not getting rid of. And then those proteins, those Louis bodies start to uh, build up and they interfere with the brain's ability to create memories. And then it also interferes with the ability to utilize dopamine. And so um, you end up seeing that you have like low dopamine and people will develop um, Parkinson's disease from it. And the reason why um, these, these things can happen is, I'm just going to come to this one, is they're actually finding that the research shows that these protein buildups are actually a way for your body to try to protect itself. Okay, So I remember, has anyone been to the play or the movie, watched the movie Les Miserables? Okay, so one part of it I really remember is when they were being attacked. They were kind of um, trying to um, uh, create this barrier so they couldn't get attacked. And so what they did was they went into the houses and they pulled all the chairs and they pulled all the tables out and they, and they made themselves a barrier, okay? So that's what that represents there is that barrier that they created, okay? So this is really good to try to keep somebody from getting into your town, your house or whatever by creating this barrier, okay? So that's what it was for. But how well can your table and chair work now? So it doesn't work very well at all when you've taken it and made a barrier out of it, okay? And what the research is showing now is that these bodies that we're making, these, uh, they call them protein misfoldings, so the amyloid plaques, the alpha-synuclein, the neurofibril tangles, and the Lewy bodies, these are all the body's way, the brain's way of trying to protect itself from an onslaught of either toxins, traumas, and inflammation. So it's actually your brain's way to try to protect itself, okay? The problem with that is it comes at a cost. And what is the cost? Is you just lost the function of that nerve now. So if you take that nerve and you break it down to try to protect itself from other things, the problem with that is now that nerve doesn't work the way it's supposed to. And the way the brain does it, the way the body does it, is it looks at the things that are that it can get rid of first, okay? And so unfortunately, your memories will be usually the first thing that your body will get rid of those neurons, okay? So if it's got this onslaught and it's trying to protect itself, it'll first get rid of the neurons that control your memories because can you live without your memories? Unfortunately, you can, but it's a really hard human experience when you can't remember things anymore, but you can live without it. If you start doing that to your brain stem, where you control breathing and heart rate, guess what would happen to you? You'd be dead pretty quickly. And so the first thing that will typically happen is it'll impact the, um, the um, uh, memory part of the brain. Then it'll start to move to other parts of the brain that it can get rid of, that again you can live without, not a good, great human experience, so it starts to move to the the frontal lobe. And now your frontal lobe, so your executive decisions, your, um, your personality and such will start to disappear. But again, can you live without those things? You can. It's, a little, it's harder than without your memories, but it's, uh, you can still live without them because again, you're not affecting the parts of the brain that keep you alive. And so this is what's happening. And so when you look at dementia, you have to think about it, okay, there is a cause, okay? Research shows time and time again that there is a cause. And if there is a cause, if you can change that cause, if you can change those things, you can either prevent Alzheimer's, slow it down, or even reverse Alzheimer's because now you've actually addressed the cause, okay? And so when you look at the uh, medications that you see, so we had mentioned a couple of them is Aricept and Namenda. Those actually, what they work on is, are you guys familiar with an antidepressant that's called an SSRI, serotonin reuptake inhibitor? And what that does is it keeps serotonin in between, you know, the nerves. If you guys remember the commercial on TV where you got those two nerves and then those little beads cross over the, the synaptic cleft and they make you feel better. And so what those drugs do is they keep that neurotransmitter alive in that, um, being able to stimulate that nerve longer. There is a neurotransmitter in our brain called acetylcholine. 
Acetylcholine allows you to create memories. That neurotransmitter, if you don't have that neurotransmitter, you can't create memories. And so this neurotransmitter, these drugs, they keep that neurotransmitter in that uh, synaptic cleft longer. So now it's trying to help your memories um, stay longer by, uh, or to be able to maintain those, uh, that function by keeping that neurotransmitter alive longer. The problem is if the nerve is damaged, it's not going to work real well. And that's why you see very limited results with these two medications. But those are the two go-to medications that you see used in America today. Okay? And so again, the problem with it is, is you're not addressing the fact that those neurons have an onslaught of damage to them. And until you change that, it's not much different than if you're smashing your hand with a hammer all day long. And then you just like every day at the end of the day, well, I'll just put some band-aids on that. And then the next day, you just keep smashing your hand. Until you stop smashing your hand with that hammer, you're going to keep having that problem. And it's going to keep going downhill. And so that's what we look at when we look at um, solving this problem because typically what we see in America is medications if you're diagnosed with dementia you're either going to you're going to be on medications a nursing home so you may end up in a place like this you may end up in another facility but what happens is it's just managing your symptoms it's just managing you and taking care of you that way it's not looking at how could we solve this problem it's just how do we help you to to be as comfortable as you possibly can okay and so unfortunately when you have the belief system that there's nothing you can do then that is really the only thing you're going to be able to do to intervene okay i literally had a patient just um this is a young girl um, just the other day, not dealing with dementia, but just understanding um, what that um, approach to healthcare looks like, is that she came into the office dealing with extreme back pain. Okay, so she's dealing with this back pain, can't barely walk. She's like basically dragging her leg, and so I start working on her. Um, probably a week or so later, she's feeling better. In fact, significantly better which she was super happy about because she was actually getting married um, in two weeks. And so she was like, okay, how am I gonna walk down the aisle dragging my leg down the aisle? So she was better for the wedding, but then right after the wedding, another flare up, she comes in, I work on her and gets better. And, um, but it's, for me in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, this is very strange for it to just get really bad and then get better so quickly. And so um, goes away, comes back again and she shows up again. I'm like, okay, we've got to get to the root of this. We've got to figure out what's going on. So send her for an MRI. She goes to, um, she ends up having to go to the emergency room because she's in so much pain before she can go get the MRI. She tells them, hey, I want to get an MRI. And they said, oh, just do some physical therapy. So she starts physical therapy and starts feeling better again. And she's like, oh, I think they solved the problem. I'm like, well, that's good. And they say, oh, I think it's a disc problem. And I'm like, in my mind, again, I'm like, OK, I've seen enough disc problems. This is not acting like a disc. But if it's helping, great. Um, so she's doing better. A couple weeks later, back in my office. This time, both her legs aren't working. So she can't barely walk. She's like walking like Frankenstein into my office. I, this is a 22-year-old girl. Okay, and so I'm like, okay, this time you're gonna get the MRI. I ordered it from a different place. Um, again, she couldn't get in early enough, so she goes to the emergency room. They do an MRI, and they don't do what I asked when I had put the order in. And so, anyways, they don't read the MRI. So um, the way that for where the pain actually is. So she comes back, and I'm like, okay, we gotta get this MRI reread or something, maybe a different uh, another MRI. Um, she goes back to her doctor and the doctor says, you know what, what we're going to do is we're just going to do pain management. And I'm like, okay, she's 22 years old. You're going to actually just manage her pain, what, for the rest of her life, which could be another 60, 70, 80 years. I don't know how long. That's, unfortunately, I mean, that seems pretty drastic that they're not going to do anything. I don't think it's much different when we look at it like this, when we look at Alzheimer's, is that when we get a diagnosis, I think a doctor should be like, we got to get to the root of this. We got to find out what is causing this and not just say, well, we'll give you meds, we'll put you in a nursing home, and we'll manage your symptoms. I don't think that's a great solution for solving people, um, solving people with a, with, a, with a health issue like that. This house here, you guys see a lot of problems with this house? So let's just say I'm looking at this house, I'm a contractor, and I say, you know what? 
I think I can solve your problem here. If we, I mean, you look at the paints kind of flaking out, if we just paint this house, we are going to fix this problem, okay? That would be ridiculous, right? You'd be like, yeah, I need a different contractor, okay? Because there's a lot of things wrong with this house, and you wouldn't address it from just one approach. And what you're going to see when it comes to dementia, and especially like with Alzheimer's and what the research is showing, is it's never one thing. Okay, and that's why if you try to do it with one med, if you just try to do it like we're going to give you this medication, you will never solve their problem because there's probably at least a dozen different reasons why their brain is starting to malfunction. Okay, and the first place you really want to start with is the foundation, right? Like, so we all know the Bible story that the wise man built his house upon the so on the rock, yeah, and, the, and the, the foolish person built his house upon the sand. So we have to look at what is our foundation then when it comes to how do we make sure that our bodies are working the way they're supposed to. So you have to look at, well, what does the brain need? What's the brain made up of? What does the brain get traumatized by? What um, causes damage to the brain? If you can develop that foundation first, then you can help somebody. Okay, until you have that, you just keep looking at, well, you know, we painted the house and that didn't solve it. Now there's a couple of broken windows there. If we replace those windows, that's probably going to solve the problem. And what really what happens is you just chase your tail all the time. You have to address the different reasons why the brain might be malfunctioning. And like I said, it's looking at um, the brain's trying to protect itself. Okay, so the first thing you have to ask is, what's it trying to protect itself from? Okay, so what are the bad guys? So if I'm looking at uh, back in World War II, they were launching missiles from uh, Europe over to England and destroying England. If I looked at, hey, you know, if we could just build these houses faster than they shoot these missiles at us, we're going to solve this problem, you'd be, you'd be lost, right? You wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to solve the problem. You have to stop the missiles. You have to stop the onslaught of these missiles. So the first thing is you need to address inflammation. So I mentioned that inflammation can cause all kinds of different um, illnesses from heart disease to uh, cancers to arthritis. So what causes inflammation? So what do you guys have heard and on the slide it talks about that. You probably can't read it in your slide because it's <laughs> even, I think she said if I brought my glasses on, I don't think glasses would help. With <laughs> so uh, maybe a telescope or something. But um, the reason I have the slides there is so that you can just make notes. Inflammation, the first thing you have to think of is nutrition. Okay, nutrition, if you aren't addressing your nutrition, uh, there's just only so much a person's going to be able to do to help themselves. I literally had a patient the other day that we were talking about brain health, and um, first thing she asked is, do I have to give up alcohol? I'm like, well, I don't know how much you're drinking or anything like that, but um, tell me more. She's like, if I have to give up alcohol, I'm not in. I don't, I don't want anything to do with this program. <laughs> uh, I was just like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So... It is interesting. People love their, 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 um, their bad habits, and it's hard. Like she was literally willing to, hey, I'll just deal with dementia. I'd rather have dementia than give up my alcohol. And I've seen that. I've seen that with people when we've told them, hey, you can't eat gluten. All right, I'll, um, I'll just die early then because I'd rather die than eat, not eat gluten. Cigarettes, yeah, <laughs> yep, smoking. Yeah, it's crazy. But what's interesting is, when you change that, like that um, uh, motive for the, like the reason why, like how many know a person that got pregnant that was a smoker that quit smoking for about their whole pregnancy? Yeah. And then the day they had their baby, they're back out smoking. So it's crazy what people will change when it's drastic or severe enough to make that change. But a lot of times you will see people are very attached to these foods that can cause a lot of damage. So you could literally have like in this slide, missiles, and you know what those missiles are now, and you don't care because you want, because you love your cheesecake, or you love your whatever. Um, I remember going um, to a Thanksgiving meal, and this guy could not stop talking about how much he loved pumpkin pie. And then, uh, and he just, I mean, I, like the way he said it, it was just like, I think he would have married it if he could have. <laughs> so, I, I'm not joking, and then he's, then, Probably five minutes later, he's talking about how we come, um, he's got high cholesterol and how he couldn't get rid of it. And he said, well, I, I know I tried the diet and it didn't work. I'm like, I don't think you tried the diet because <laughs> just listening to you talk about your pumpkin pie. Uh, anyway, 
uh, processed foods, okay? Why are processed foods so bad for us? Like why, so there's sugar in them for sure. So someone said salt, who said? Yeah, yeah so, so um, and we'll talk sodium chloride as salt because sea salt actually has tons of different minerals in it, but table salt is sodium chloride and yeah, that, that can be very harmful to our body, especially how they prepare it and, and create it. Um, so processed foods, they come with sugars, so they're usually a lot of added sugars. The type of sugars that we add to it can be like high fructose corn syrup. And so high fructose corn syrup, how they um, make it can become uh, a toxin to us just in that alone. So we look at the, um, the high fructose corn syrup, we look at uh, uh, just um, added sugar, we look at some of the sugar like the artificial sweeteners, okay? What you guys have to realize is that when you eat food, your body, what it needs to do, like when you put it in your body, when it goes into your stomach, when it goes in your small intestine, that food technically is not inside your body yet, okay? Your body has to figure out what should come in and it keeps out what shouldn't come in. So literally your digestive system is like a giant filter, okay? And it's a barrier and it tries to keep bad stuff out. The problem is if you keep putting bad stuff in or, or causing damage, like how many here are familiar with a leaky gut? A leaky gut is that barrier is compromised and now things can get into your body that never should have got there, okay? And so your body's supposed to be able to keep it out, but if you do damage to it, then you're gonna cause problems. So processed foods are notorious for creating leaky guts, okay? Then, when that food gets into your body, it's a lot of the processed foods, so back in the 1950s is when you really started to see it, after K rations came out in the military, then they're like, hey, we could do, make, create uh, a longer shelf life. So that was the first reason why they created processed foods, was to create longer shelf life, okay? So the, what did they add to make um, longer shelf lives? So preservatives, yep, so you would try to preserve it to make it last longer, okay? The problem with that is it makes it harder for your body to break that food down because that food is preserved. And then they decided, you know what, maybe we could make it taste better because this tastes really bad. So then they started adding flavor enhancers. They started adding things that would make you want to eat it more. Uh, they started making it colors that were more appealing. So all of a sudden, food became this designer food. It didn't just become preserved food. It was designer food. And the problem is when you add colors to it that are artificial, what do you think your body does with those? Yeah, your body does not know what to do with that. It's never seen it before, okay? So your body says, I don't know what this is. I can't break it down. I don't, I, and the problem is it just sits in your body then. And if you have this barrier that's, um, that's been impacted, causing a leaky gut, that food can get in, that stuff can get in, but you don't know what to do with it. So processed foods come with sugars, they come with preservatives, they come with artificial flavors, they come with artificial colors, and your body has no idea what to do with it. And so, but the only thing it knows is maybe I should attack it. Okay, this is something I've never seen before, so it must be a foreign substance. So now I create an immune response, and I create an immune response to food. Is that, does anyone know anybody with food sensitivities? I deal with a food sensitivity. And so why is that? Because we've caused um, our food to be, look more like something, kind of foreign substance that we need to attack. So we have um, immune responses. You can develop into autoimmune responses. So this is why processed foods are absolutely to be avoided as much as you possibly can. So eating food in its natural state is the best thing you wanna do. So if you're looking at preventing it, slowing it down, reversing it, the first thing that person needs to do is they gotta cut all these processed foods, the sugar. Um, if they have a leaky gut, they need to address that. The more food sensitivities you have, the more likely you're developing, you've developed a leaky gut. Um, there are um, blood tests that we can do to measure if someone has a leaky gut, but um, these foods can create all these problems. And then there's foods that we look at that actually are healthy foods that can actually cause problems too. Um, nightshade plants. Why could nightshade plants be a bad thing? Is anyone familiar with nightshade plants? Yeah, so, so why are nightshade plants, we know, uh, so they're tomatoes, they're peppers, they're potatoes. So these are healthy foods. Why is it that they're, they become a problem for some people? Say that again. Not, you know, it's not a toxin. 
No, it's not acid. It's not, but it can kind of be like a toxin because what the plant does is it tries to protect itself from being eaten. So it's, these plants have learned to create these proteins called lectins. And lectins, if you guys, has anyone ever heard of Dr. Stephen Gundry, The Plant Paradox? So he goes in great detail about lectins. Gluten is a lectin. It's a way that the plant has produced um, a protein to protect itself, okay? And so the hard part is you have a harder time digesting it. So there are ways to get around that, different ways that we cook our food. Uh, tomatoes, if you peel a tomato, most of the lectins are on the outside of a tomato. And so if you peel a tomato, you're less likely to react to it. So there's a lot of different um, cooking techniques that we kind of gotten rid of that um, because of, you know, we just like to eat food for the taste of it. And so lectins are an important thing to think of. And then grains, I'd mentioned gluten. The other reason we should avoid processed foods, though, is they're covered with pesticides and herbicides. And so that's another way that we can cause damage to our body is through these different um, chemicals that are on our foods. And so um, where, how would you get exposed? So glyphosate, that's Roundup, by the way. Okay, so where, where would you in your diet get exposed to Roundup, do you think? Yeah, pretty much non-organic food. So um, there is a plant called Roundup Ready corn. Has anyone heard of this before? So you can go out in the field. I grew up on a grain farm, so I, I've seen this happen. You can go out and they can spray corn with Roundup, and it won't kill the corn, but it'll kill everything else. Okay, Roundup, Agent Orange is where that um, came from. And so you'll kill all other plants except for corn can live. Okay, so the problem is, do you think they've washed that corn so well that there's no more Roundup on it when you eat that corn? Or when the animal that's getting fed that corn eats that corn? Absolutely not. That animal is eating Roundup, and that Roundup will sit inside that body of that animal, and then you eat the animal, and now you've got a problem. Okay? The other thing that they started doing, um, two summers ago I was home, I was driving around looking at the crops with my mom, so I, I grew up in southeast Saskatchewan. We're driving around and we drive by this crop of uh, peas and it's still looking green and, my, and with peas you wait till they dry out and, uh, and they're not green like when you harvest them in your garden. And so we come by this field and my mom said, oh yeah, we're going to be able to combine that in about a week. I'm like, combine that, it's still green. How would you be able to do that? She's like, oh, we just sprayed it yesterday. So what they're doing now, what farmers are doing, is they spray these crops with Roundup. It'll kill the plant, but they want to kill the plant because that'll speed up the ability that they can harvest it when they want to harvest it. The other thing is it does is that plant goes in this protective mode, and so it actually plumps up the seed, and so now you get a bigger yield. Okay? Because farmers get paid not necessarily by quality, they get paid by quantity. And so that is a food, that is a, a farming technique that none of you are aware of, yet that you're getting exposed to it all the time. You eat peas, guaranteed that that's what they're doing, unless it's uh, organic food, okay? So you can see that foods can definitely cause it. Um, APOE4, so again, we talked about this, but I want you to understand a little bit more about that gene. That gene is a gene that helps you to protect yourself by actually creating inflammation. Okay, because is inflammation always bad? If you twist your ankle, um, it's going to get red and it's going to get hot. It's going to get inflamed. The reason it's doing that is it's actually part of the healing um, mechanism. So you need to have inflammation. It's chronic inflammation that causes us to get sick. So we have this inflammation when we have an APOE4 gene we create more inflammation. So it's actually a really good gene to have if you're like experiencing a lot of different traumas because you can heal really fast from those traumas. But the problem is if you keep having traumas all the time, you're going to just be constantly inflamed and that's the problem with that gene. Okay, so there's different um, versions of it. Um, there's an APOE two, an APOE three, and an APOE four. And you get one from each parent, okay? So if one of your parents was APOE two, and the other one was APOE three, you would be what they call APOE two three, okay? But if both your parents are APOE four, then you will be APOE four four, and you will be 80 to 85% more likely that you'll develop Alzheimer's disease. 
Okay? So again, a great gene to have, especially when you're young and you're injuring yourself. You'll heal fast and such. But the problem is, is that if you constantly are causing an onslaught of damage to your body, then you constantly have that gene activated and it will start to create chronic inflammation. Okay? So that's what can happen with the APOE. And then infections. Infections can cause um, all kinds of different um, um, uh, problems in our body, but especially it can cause chronic inflammation because we have a chronic um, immune response to that uh, infection. Okay? How would you get an infection in your body um, that's just chronically needing to be attacked? How, what, what are some like, ways that we can get them? What are some of the diseases you think of? Yeah, so dental hygiene is huge. They literally just did a study in Switzerland that they showed that 90% of all people, this lady was doing autopsies on the brains of um, Alzheimer's patients, she found that 90% of those patients had spirochetes, which is a bacteria that spirals itself into your, like corkscrews itself into your tissue. 90% of those people had a spirochete infection in their brain. Sure, yep, so yeah, is it the chicken or the egg? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so um, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I'll tell you that 30% of them had Lyme, so it probably wasn't from, um, from that, but 70% had dental. Um, so there's a, a trichomonas is a spirochete, and it will, it's mostly in the, in the mouth, it will move its way into, if you have uh, a periodontal disease, you get bloody gums, and then that can get into your bloodstream, and then it can get up into the brain. So, so um, infections. Um, so I mentioned one, Lyme disease. Lyme disease is a huge one. And people, um, the problem with Lyme disease is that you're seeing many, many people getting tested for it, and it comes back negative. But the research shows that there's, uh, I can't remember the percentage, but how many people actually have a false negative, meaning they have Lyme disease, but the test comes back and it says you don't have Lyme disease. So it's a pretty significant one. We see Lyme a lot in our office because it's such a hard infection to deal with. It buries itself. It literally corkscrews itself in your tissue. Once it's in there, your immune system can't get at it. And it'll do it in your nervous system, especially because it can't get to your nervous system. Um, your immune system can't get at it. So uh, how about herpes zoster? Are you guys familiar with herpes zoster? What is it? What's another? Um, what's the name for it that we get? It's like shingles. Yep. So shingles or chicken pox. So we get chicken pox as a kid. Our immune system pushes it, suppresses it back into our nervous system. And if our immune system stays strong, it'll keep it there forever. Um, if we're constantly getting exposed to chicken pox, then we boost our immune system. And so it keeps it at bay. But what aren't kids getting anymore? Chicken pox. So what are you not getting exposed to anymore? Chicken pox. So what are we seeing? We're seeing shingles running rampant. Um, I've seen it uh, in, in a kid as early as 11 years old dealing with shingles. Uh, I have a patient right now that's 16 years old with shingles. So we're seeing shingles showing up. It's not just old people because we're not getting exposed to that. Um, um. Yeah, so if you have chicken pox as a kid, then you can get shingles. You can't technically get chicken pox again. But if you get exposed to chicken pox again and again, it keeps boosting your immune system. It's a natural booster to it. So then it keeps it suppressed. Uh, the problem is once that immunity starts to wane, then shingles can express itself. And it'll usually do it when you really stress your immune system by like a high period of stress or travel. Then you'll, that's when you'll see a lot of times shingles will express itself. What does the shingles shot for Yeah, so the shingles shot is kind of like a booster for um, herpes uh, zoster. So basically it gets you, it boosts your immune system. So um, you can do it that way. I tell people, hey, you can't get exposed to chicken pox anymore really, but you can go to the nursing home and hang out with people that got shingles and that will help boost your immune system. <laughs> the only problem is if you're immune suppressed, or right, if it's already suppressed enough now, you'll express shingles. So, so it's a kind of a fine line. So, um, so yeah, that's what the vaccine does. Um, so that's the inflammatory um, um, aspect of it. I'm just going to check our time, see how we're doing on time. So we have a few minutes left. So this is when I, when I come and speak to people. This is when I start really getting into more of the details of it. So I had mentioned that inflammation can cause um, Alzheimer's, but so can um, toxins. 
So um, I'll do a whole talk just on toxins because just that alone takes over an hour to talk about uh, all the different toxins. Inflammation, I go into much more detail than I did here. Um, but then also some of the other things that can cause, that can lead us to dementia is not enough of a hormone, okay? And so how many here know somebody that's dealing with hypothyroidism? Okay, so it's a, they say that there's an estimated 50 million Americans right now. Siri wants to talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> So they say that there's an estimated 50 it's million. Oh, <laughs> see, she's so helpful. Um, <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, yeah. You need to be done. So, um, so where was I? I was talking about. Uh, yeah, so the 50 million people dealing with. Uh, and I would say that only about 5 million, they say only about 5 million people know that they're dealing with a thyroid issue and 50 million people have it. So that's showing that a lot of people don't know. They go to the doctor, the doctor does a TSH, which technically isn't even a measurement of the thyroid, it's a measurement of the brain trying to stimulate the thyroid. And so the problem with that is we've had, I don't know how many patients that have gone in for a thyroid test, their TSH tested normal, and then we ran a full thyroid panel and showed that no, it's, it's not functioning at the level it should. So lots of different uh, um, hormones that can impact it. Estrogen, estrogen is very protective for the brain in women. Okay, so if you have low estrogen, then um, it'll make you more prone to um, Alzheimer's disease. And what's so interesting, I don't know how many patients I've told, like, okay, I, I suspect that you might have low estrogen. Um, they're in menopause, though. So then I said, you got to go talk to your doctor, and I want you to push for them to do a hormone test on you to test your estrogen. And they'll come back almost guaranteed. I can pretty much tell them this is what your doctor is going to tell you when you say that. Is yeah, they said that I got menopause. I'm in menopause, so of course my estrogen is going to be low. Okay, that's just that makes no sense to me. I'm not asking you if it's going to be low compared to a 20-year-old woman. I'm asking you to go get your estrogen check to compare you to someone else your age to see if you have low estrogen. And so I always tell them, you know, that's what you got to tell the doctor because otherwise they won't do that test. They will never do that test because they'll always say, well, it's going to be low. Well, that doesn't mean that we can't look to see if it's lower than normal in my age group because low estrogen, um, estrogen is very protective for the brain. Okay, in men, testosterone is uh, um, very protective, and so hormones can really impact it. Um, traumas I'd mentioned. The thing with traumas, when you look at traumas, uh, most people will know that they've had head traumas, okay? And so you obviously want to do things to protect yourself from further head traumas, okay? And so when you look at aging people, what are some of the major issues that they deal with? Falls, absolutely. And when you fall, it's the number one reason why someone will end up in a nursing home, is a fall. And if you fall and you're older and you hit your head on the cement or hit your head on something when you go down, that could be um, an absolutely life-changing, never return from that um, fall um, uh, type of a, an event. So it's really important. So why is it that they, as we get older, do we fall more? Balance is a huge one. What else does someone say? Um, strength, too, is the other one. Okay. So my parents went over to um, Japan because my stepsister was living in Japan. And they came back, and they had a lot of pictures. I guarantee you the thing they took the most pictures of was the bathrooms and the toilets. Okay. Has anyone ever been to Japan? Okay, so they don't have a toilet. There is literally a hole in the ground. It's a pretty fancy hole in the ground, but that's where they squat down and go to the bathroom. Okay. Now in America, we don't have that, right? Because um, you couldn't squat down, and never you would have a hard time getting back up again because our knees are shot and such. As we get older in America, what we do is keep making the toilet seats taller and taller, and putting handles so that we can basically enables us to never use those joints. And so why is it in Asia that they can do that is because they learn to squat. They keep squatting down. So to squat down is a healthy thing for us, but the problem is we get these joint health issues and such. And so anyways, when you look at um, 
um, uh, falls, some of the reasons why we're falling is because we just don't have the strength because we stopped using those muscles, okay? And so it's really important to exercise, to strengthen yourself, to learn to do squats. I tell people as they get older, even if you just did squats down to the chair, like every day, work on that, that's gonna be super healthy um, and helpful for you because you were gonna be less likely to fall. But balance is another issue, which is another sign of brain health issues when you have poor balance, okay? So, um, so then traumas um, that uh, can cause um, um, Alzheimer's. I'd mentioned deficiencies, so some of the nutrients that we have. Um, vitamin D. Vitamin D is something that uh, we all need, and where do we get it from? And where do you get it from in February in Minnesota? <laughs> I like that one. I always tell people, if you could convince your insurance company that, hey, just a Mex trip to Mexico. <laughs> yeah, so Florida would be a good um, thing because um, you can build up storage again of your vitamin D. But if you're not getting it from um, the sun, where are you going to get it from? Say that again. Supplements. supplements. Yeah, where do people, like, so supplements is kind of a new thing. Before supplements, where do people get it from that lived in, the, in Minnesota or Sweden or... Um, so milk is fortified with it, and it's only whole milk that's fortified with it. So where did we get, again, so that would be supplemented with, a, or fortified with a supplement. So where did we get it from there? What's that? Oranges. Yeah, so not oranges, that's more vitamin C, and they do add vitamin D to orange juice. Sorry. No, that's, um, where else? How about, you guys remember this, your grandma giving you cod liver oil? So cod liver oil had vitamin D in it, okay? Because you know what organ has lots of vitamin D in it? What organ? Yeah. Liver. Liver. Okay, so I was speaking to a nursing home the other day, and every one of those people grew up with liver, and then they fed some liver to their children, and then their children fed me none. <laughs> and so, so that was the end of that. And, yeah, and so now if you talk to a kid about liver, they don't, yeah, they don't know what you're talking about. And so we, in the matter of three generations, got rid of a healthy habit that people have been doing for thousands of years. So, but the nice thing is we can do supplements. So, so we can have deficiencies, toxicity. How many here, have heard, yeah, no worries, no worries. Um, and we're just about done. How many have ever heard of type three diabetes? Okay, so we've all heard of probably type one or used to be called um, um, adolescent uh, uh, diabetes. Um, the reason why they don't call it adolescent is you're actually seeing type 1 diabetes in adults now, okay? Um, type 1 diabetes is an autoimmune disease where your body destroys the cells that make your insulin. So now you're an insulin-dependent diabetic, okay? So that's type 1. And then type 2 diabetes used to be called adult-onset diabetes. And why is it not called that anymore? Yeah, we're seeing kids 12, 13 years old with type 2 diabetes already. And that's what we call insulin-resistant diabetes. Type 3 diabetes, it's, you know, a lot of people are calling Alzheimer's type 3 diabetes, is your brain uses 30% of all the fuel that you bring into your body. 30% of the oxygen and 30% of the glucose is used for your brain. And your brain only makes up 2% of your body, yet it uses... 30% of the fuel that you take in. The brain is a very, it's kind of a, a fuel pig, okay? It's just, it wants fuel and it uses a lot of it, okay? So it uses glucose, but what happens if you're insulin resistant? What we're seeing with type 3 diabetes is you're actually seeing people develop insulin resistance in their brain, but not the rest of their body. So they're literally, they can't get that sugar into the cells of their brain, and that brain is being starved of fuel. Okay, and we uh, someone had mentioned uh, the keto diet or that that uh, fat bombs or keto. What the ketogenic diet is doing and why it works really good for kids with epilepsy and for people that are dealing with Parkinson's and people that are dealing with Alzheimer's is because when they can't get sugar into their, into their cells, they can get fat into their cells and they can use fat for fuel. That's the whole purpose of the ketogenic diet is to teach your body, your brain to use fat for fuel. And that's why you will see people like I've, I've watched videos of people that have full-blown Parkinson's disease and when they do ketogenic, they have no signs of Parkinson's disease whatsoever. Yeah? My son-in-law's uh, liver was way 
Yeah. Yeah. So yep. I put him on keto the ketogenic diet. Yeah, except that now uh, if somebody eats fat all the time, then they can get heart disease because yep. of all the fat. Potentially, depending on what kind of fat they're eating, because this is the key, and it happened with the Atkins diet too. When people switch to the Atkins diet, they're like, "Well, cool, I'll just eat bacon and um, ham. Yeah, I'll eat all this crappy protein. That that was never what that diet was meant to be, and so." Good healthy um, fat will not cause heart disease. It'll actually prevent heart disease. But the key is it's got to be good healthy fat. Yeah, and the problem is, yeah, the problem is you're seeing people on that ketogenic diet, like, yeah, again, I'll eat a pound of bacon a day and stuff like that. And it's, I'm not saying that ba bacon is terrible, but it's definitely not as healthy as eating, um, like, plant-based fats and, uh, and then uh, good healthy fats from pasture-raised animals. And so to answer that question is, it depends on what they're eating for fat, okay? So what's interesting is you think about why would a fatty diet um, help with someone dealing with a fatty liver, okay? And so, because you mentioned that they gave him that, he had fatty liver. Yeah. The, the reason why people are developing, have you guys heard of this, non-alcohol fatty liver disease? Yeah, it's, it's, yeah it's, it's running rampant right now. And the reason why is because of the food pyramid. So back in the 80s and the 90s, they told us we needed to be eating 6 to 11 servings of grains every day. 6 to 11. I, if you guys remember that, I remember it was cereal for breakfast with toast, um, sandwiches for lunch. Um, at supper time, you always had a loaf of bread with a thing of margarine. You had uh, uh, pasta. So you're trying to get 6 to 11 servings of grains into your body every day. Well, those grains, what happens is they have a lot of sugar in them. Okay, your body can only store a certain amount of sugar. Very little sugar, actually, it can store it. If it doesn't have it, uh, if it can't, if those sugar stores are full, then the next thing the body will do is it'll go one first into insulin resistance because it'll say, "I don't need any more sugar. Stop giving me sugar. I'm actually going to stop you from being able to bring sugar into my cells anymore." So you go insulin resistant, and what does it do with that excess sugar? Do you guys think? It turns it into fat, and it stores it in the liver. And that's why you see so many people developing non-alcohol fatty liver disease because of they're eating too many grains. And again, most people would have thought it was because I was eating too much fat. It's actually because you're converting all that extra sugar into fat. So, so type 3 diabetes really needs to be taken care of because if that brain can't get fuel, that brain is going to start dying off. And it'll start protecting itself. It'll say, I'm only going to give fuel to the parts of my brain that are going to keep me alive. And it'll start shutting off the fuel to your hippocampus and such. So there are warning signs of dementia. Uh, blood sugar issues is a big one. Brain fog, brain fatigue. You start reading, you're five minutes into reading, like, you know, I could just go to bed right now. That's, uh, uh, now if it's nighttime and you're reading, that's different. But if you're like middle of the day and you start reading and like, oh man, I'm tired now, that's a sign that your brain's fatiguing. Dizziness and vertigo. Um, and I'm not talking about the crystal that moved out of the ear and now, my, now the room's spinning. I'm talking about when I stand up, I feel like, uh, like kind of I'm moving all over the place. So that's the kind of the dizziness I'm talking about. Poor memory, of course. Um, headaches, loss of senses. The number one uh, sign of uh, Parkinson's disease um, is not tremors. You have to lose 80% of your brain uh, of the substantia nigra, the part that produces dopamine, before you'd have tremors. But you can actually do sniff, uh, smell tests, peppermint, coffee, and anise. Those are those smells. They start to go. You're on the road to Parkinson's. Um, so it's um, peppermint, coffee, anise, or black licorice. Yeah, so those smells. So the cool thing is you can actually go online and order these scratch and sniff tests and you scratch them and you sniff and then you write down what you think it is and at the end you can see a key and you can see how bad your smell is getting. And it's a, it's a really good test to do because that is the first thing that goes when it comes to Parkinson's. The first smell that goes in um, Alzheimer's is being able to smell peanut butter. 
So they actually, the University of Florida did a test where they literally just held a cup of peanut butter and they'd measure how far up before that person with their eyes closed could smell that peanut butter and they'd look at each nostril. And I don't know if about you guys, when someone opens a jar of peanut butter in a room, I could smell it across the room. These people can't smell it like right here. And so how much do you think that test costs? Yeah, that test um, costs pennies, peanut butter, right? How many have ever gone to the doctor and they say, hey, we should do this test on you? Nobody. So it should be, done, again, it's done at the University of Florida. There's a cool YouTube video on it. Um, so some of the other things is gut health, stomach acid issues. But where do you start? This is the hard part. Is This can be completely overwhelming because um, there's so many different uh, um, places to start. If there's so many different causes, there's a lot of different places to start. What we tell people is, is critical tests. Before you guys leave, when you leave, if you want us to email you this so you can actually read these slides, just write down your email address. We'll email it to you. Because these critical tests, I'm guaranteeing you can't read them on your, on your sheets. But these are some of the blood tests. And the problem, unfortunately, is if you went to your doctor and, and said, I want all these tests done, they're not going to do 90% of those tests because they don't fall into the category of routine uh, tests when you do a physical. Okay? But they're absolutely necessary if you really want to find out if you're at risk for, for um, Alzheimer's or if you're already showing signs of it. And then the other thing you need to do is you do need to make the changes. So that's the hard part. It's not hard to go get a blood test. It's hard to pay for it because it costs money. But it's not, um, it's not as hard as making these changes, trying to change your diet, implementing supplements. Um, um, I, um, um, the deficiencies, I didn't go into great detail. But if you look at some of the things, if you just decide, you know what, I'll just do all the supplements. Um, and if you look at um, um, the book, The End of Alzheimer's by Dr. Dale Bredesen, he has a whole list of supplements you could take. Well, I did the math, and you would be spending $1,000 every month on those supplements, so, which is expensive. Nothing compared to ending up in a nursing home, though, is every month you're spending like 12 grand a month. Um, so I get that um, it's expensive, and you don't want to end up in a nursing home. But what I try to do is I try to tell people, teach people, through testing and such as, hey, these are the supplements you'd need. You don't need to do all these supplements. But I know people that will come in and say, I'm doing all these different supplements. Okay, Some of them are good. Some are a waste of money. And some actually could be ha causing harm, you know, depending on what's going on with your health. So supplements is uh, an important thing. Uh, sleep, breathing, stress levels, exercise. These are all things that are really um, things that a person can do. I'm not going to go into detail about all of them because what I've done in the past is I've come back and I've done like a talk just on inflammation, a talk on just nutrition, a talk on um, how to do an anti-inflammatory diet. And if that's something that you guys are interested in, then let Natalie know and I'll come back and do that, uh, those talks because it is important to know what's going on in the brain. It's important to know what can be causing it. But the most important thing is not knowing what to do. What do you guys think is the most important thing? Is actually doing it. Yeah. The difference between wisdom and knowledge, right? It's, uh, it's application. And so we need to do it. So where do you start? Um, you want to start implementing those changes. Um, like I said, we will come back and do more talks on how to implement those. But one of the things I would say a great place to start is to actually meet with a practitioner like myself and just look at, okay, where, am I at? where are my biggest risk factors? Where do I have issues that I need to deal with so you can be, you're not just taking the shotgun approach. I'll take all the supplements, I'll do all the exercising, I'll do all the different brain exercises. I'll, um, I literally watched, I had a guy the other day send me an email, I don't know if you saw that, of all the things he's doing for his mom. And um, I mean, it was, I think it was 50 pages worth of stuff. And it, yeah, it was, and yeah, so anyways, this guy, he had a, a, her day-to-day -day routine of his mom. And it was, it was crazy how the supplements he had her on. Like she literally, he said that um, she's like um, really ready to be done just because she feels like all she does all day long is take supplements. And the list that he had, it was crazy. Like 
this guy was a very, very anal person <laughs> because he literally had things on there like, okay, from 6.55 to 7, no, I think it was like 3.30 to 3.35, you get a five-minute coffee break, Mom. And don't forget to relax, it said on there. <laughs> I, I, I'm just like, okay, I don't think she can because you're like stressing her out. So, so again, seeing a practitioner that can help guide and direct you, it, it's cost to go see a practitioner, but it could save you a lot of money because if you're spending all this money on supplements you don't need, doing things that aren't going to be helpful, that could be a lot of wasted time, money, and effort. So, so hopefully this is helpful. Did you guys find this helpful tonight? Uh, and again, if you guys want me to come back, just talk to Natalie. She'll get uh, uh, it set up again that I can be here. So um, I didn't leave a lot of time for questions, but definitely if you guys have questions, any Cool, you guys are ready to be out of here. She said I was done 10, 15 minutes ago. Well, you guys have a great rest of the night. Again, there's fat bombs in the back. There's some water if you want to grab some. I'm up here in the front for the next few minutes, and I can answer any questions. 